Good day. It's good to be here with you once more and thank you again for welcoming me into your place. I pray that God uh, has uh, been good to you because the Bible teaches that God is good all the time. I just want to begin by introducing a person that's not long around anymore. As a matter of fact, he died uh, a long time ago. His name is J.C. Ryle. He was born May 1816 and died June 1900 at the age of 84. Now, Ryle was an evangelical and also became the first Anglican bishop of Liverpool, England. And he said this about Christians, quote, True Christian is called to be a soldier and must behave as such from the day of conversion to the day of death. He is not meant to live a life of religious ease, idleness, and security. He must never imagine for a moment that he can sleep and doze along the way to heaven like traveling in an easy carriage. Now, 21st century author and writer Greg Morris in his article, I Have Fought the Good Fight, ponders the words of the Apostle Paul in his second letter to Timothy, where Paul said, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And Moore said this about Paul, quote, Paul looked unflinchingly down at the grave, backward on his service and faith, and forward to an eternal crown and everlasting future with his Lord. Our blessed assurance, our great confidence is not ultimately that we lived a remarkable life on earth, but that Jesus did. By his life, his death, his resurrection, we have joy waiting. Please turn in your Bibles, however you're reading the text, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, where we continue as we bring this series, What is the Church, to a close next week. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 to 16. Please read with me. Verse 11, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And as uh, we begin to explore these uh, verses here in, Timothy, uh, in this letter to Timothy, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you illuminate our minds and, and uh, open our hearts and, and teach us and mold us and shape us to become more like Christ. We do this to honor you and to bring you great glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we began chapter 6. We began with the, what I like to call the meat and potatoes. Now here, as we uh, engage with verse 11, Paul is beginning to wind down his letter to bring it to a close. And Paul concludes this letter with a charge and a command to his co-laborer, his dear friend, Timothy. Um, and here in verse 11, Paul said to Timothy, you can just read this phrase with me, but you man of God. It's interesting to note that this is the only place in the New Testament that this term is used to describe a person. In the Old Testament, it's used about 75 times, and it always refers to a man who officially spoke for God. So Paul here, exhorting Timothy to be strong and faithful in the face of the persecution and the troubles in Ephesus at large, and certainly this would include the troubles as a result of the false teachers in the church as well. But friends, Timothy would need to be more than strong and faithful. He would need to do what Paul exhorts him here to do, exhorts us to do, to flee from all this. So for, for, flee from what? Flee from all of what? 
Well, if you are familiar with this letter, and I hope you have, if you've been tracking with us in this letter, things like false teaching and godless myths and meaningless talk and controversies and old wives' tales, old wives' tales, whatever that was, quibbling over words and love of money, for example. And the question we need to ask yourself, what is the fruit of such things? Well, Paul explains the fruit, or tells us the fruit, if you will, here in verse 4 of chapter 6, the fruit of all that kind of stuff that we're to flee from, that Timothy was to flee from, is envy and strife and malicious talk and evil suspicions and constant friction. And this is between, this is from people of what Paul calls corrupt mind. We look at his letter to the Ephesians, a wonderful letter written by Paul. And in there you'll see, if you are aware, if you're not aware, you're going to be aware, because I'm going to tell you right now, he was laser-focused when it came to the truth found in Jesus. And Paul said this, You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, you find that in chapter 4 of that letter. Now, the metaphor is very clear here for us. We are to take off the former way of life like we take off a coat. We put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, like we put on a coat. But here in uh, chapter 6, verse 11, the text here, the emphasis is much, force, much more forceful, much stronger. We must flee from our old self. We don't just take off the coat. We flee from that old self. So we flee, for example, from lying and, and replace it with truth and honesty. We, we flee from swearing and taking God's name in vain, for example, OMG. We flee from all that. We speak beneficial things. We speak, we speak uplifting things. We speak uh, truth with love and all those kinds of things. We flee from selfish ambition, uh, from idolizing things such as money and, and, and things and people as well. We flee. We run from the things of a corrupt mind. We flee like Joseph did from uh, Potiphar's wife who wanted to take him to bed and we flee despite the consequences like Joseph was accused of, of basically assaulting his wife falsely and put in jail. And there will be consequences if we as true believers uh, flee from these kinds of things. What we have here then, what Paul is presenting to us is a contrast between the false teachers and all of those who continue in the old Self, contrasted with people like Paul and Timothy and true believers in Ephesus who trusted fully in Christ, who put their trust in Christ and his word, that is the Bible. If you remember what Paul said about the Bible in 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, if you remember John 3.16, remember 2 Timothy 3.16, very important scripture, it says there, well, Paul said, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Pastor Timothy, we'll call him a pastor because he was, and the church in Ephesus, the church today in the world, we must seek to be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God has called us to do. You see, friends, the Christian flees from all ungodliness. And now Paul exhorted Timothy here to what? To pursue something. Pursue what? To pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. What we have here, folks, really is six virtues or uh, six qualities that Christians, that true believers and followers of Christ are to pursue. And for those of us who are familiar with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Spirit as described in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You will notice the similarities here with these particular qualities, these six qualities of a Christian here in this text. Now, dictionary.com defines the verb pursue in this way. Quote, to follow, to strive, to gain, to seek, to attain, or accomplish. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, uh, we use him as an example uh, describes his ministry as an apostle of Christ 
to the church in Corinth, for he was being challenged about that. And we see in that letter that Paul was one who pursued the things of God. And he exhorted the Corinthians to imitate him and run like he ran. Where Paul said, run in such a way as to get the prize. What prize? Well, to get a crown that will last forever, not just some simple trophy to put on the stand. No, Paul said, I beat my body, I make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Now, the writer to the Hebrews that we have here in the New Testament put it this way. This is a bit of a longer text, so bear with me. Check it for yourself. I'll mention the reference at the end. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful people so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Did you know that you signed up for a race? You did. Are you running the race? Are you beating your body? Are you making it your slave? Another 21st century author and writer, Marshall Segal, challenged us today, challenges us today with this thought. Quote, are you pursuing faith in Jesus? Not just keeping faith, but pursuing faith. Are you making time every day to be with God through his word, the Bible? Are you intentionally looking for ways to grow and to serve in the local church? And you can't do that from the couch, folks. But also notice that Segal has only addressed faith in our list that we find in verse 11. How about the others? Are you pursuing each of them? Are you daily throwing everything off that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles you? What sin has got you entangled? What is so familiar to you, whether it's pride or anger? Or what is it? Pornography. Throw it off. And are your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith? Why do you go to church? Why do you worship God? Why do you call yourself a Christian? Do you know the answers to that? Now, Morrison, another one of his articles, suggests that there are five bad reasons to go to church. Let's go through those together. One, to be comfortable. To be comfortable. And the idea here is that church can be treated by some like a country club, because that's where you get free childcare and free coffee and free food and motivational speeches and good friendships. And if one is not careful, these can become the reason to go to church, to be comfortable. Two, I like what Morris calls this one. He calls it wobbly opinions. Wobbly opinions. This is teaching for popularity. Preaching for popularity. Discussing instead of preaching God's word. Inspirational speeches. Motivational talks. TED talks. Questions and skepticism about God's Bible. You see, the New Testament, folks, if you'll read it carefully, gives us a new, gives us a different kind of preacher. Not a new kind of preacher, but a different kind of preacher. And Morris uses the example of John the Baptist, where John the Baptist didn't discuss, he preached. Jesus, he drew people to him because he spoke on behalf of God, not about self. Number three, to be entertained. To hear what suits a person's desires. You know, like money, Better health, popularity, a better job, a good relationship, 10 ways for a better life, now, however you want to put it. These are the ones that want to be entertained with those things. These is to be assured, to be coddled, to be told everything's okay. Just smile and have a good day, to feel good. See, John the Baptist was not one to shy away from real, real issues. He didn't buy into cheap grace. His preaching 
was not for the Sunday believers sipping lattes in Starbucks, Starbucks and pretending that's worship. And here's where it really hits the, uh, the nail on the head because I understand that why we have digital ministry. I, mean, I know it's important in some respect or in many other areas. But even if you sit around eating pretzels on the couch, participating in a digital service, no, 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 that's not what we need to do. Four, to be shielded from reality. You know, Morris really likes John the Baptist, and I do too. Because John warned people that without repentance they would be what? Okay? No. Here's, here's the rough words. Cut down and thrown in the fire. Morris writes this about John the Baptist. Quote, John the Baptist did not mumble about judgment or whisper hell away through frictions. He did not pretend to be more loving and forgiving than God. And five, the fifth one, to hear mainly about ourselves. See, John the Baptist, if you, re you read him in the Gospels, always pointed people to Jesus. See, John the Baptist was not the light of the world, but a witness to the light of the world. See, many today preach and teach a man-centered message. It brings many into the building, brings crowds even. They downplay the authority of the Bible, the inspiration of the Bible. These kinds of preachers and teachers from the pulpit or in the church, proclaim the glory of man instead of the glory of God and his son, Jesus Christ. See, if you are a Christian, you are in a race. It's not a sprint, but a marathon. Therefore, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Pursue those things. So we have flee, we have pursue, and now we have fight. Where Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Because it is a spiritual fight, battle. Read the Bible, you'll see that. Friends, when the culture tries to impose its values and beliefs on you, do you defend the truth? Or do you say, it's not my fight? It's not my fight. Well, the writer of Hebrews would disagree with you. He was writing to Jewish Christians who were suffering persecution, who were constantly under the pressure to conform to the culture. And he said this to them, Holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. We are his house. Now, don't take that literally, but we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Paul said this to the Corinthian church, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And to the Philippian church, Paul said this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Friends, Whoever you are, whoever's listening to this, watching this, what are you holding on to? What are you holding tightly to? Is it your money? Is it your health? Is it your family? Is it your success? Is it your sin? Is it your anger? Is it your name? What is it that you're holding on to tightly? Paul said to Timothy, take hold of the eternal life. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's go back to the Philippian church. Paul, in that letter, gives the church there a list of all his accomplishment as accomplishments as a Pharisee. And as a Jewish, as a Pharisee, Paul, Paul's pedigree was unimpeachable. But Paul said this, about that time. He said, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And that word garbage, to be rightly translated, should say dung. I consider them dung. I don't want to say the English version of that. 
or my, our version. It was the early days of the church, first 200 plus years. Two plagues went through the Roman Empire. And the first one occurred over a 15 year period of time, around 165 to 180 AD. The second one happened about 100 years later. And during that first one, the 15 years of the first one, about a third of the Roman Empire's population died. Christians and pagans were affected together. When you consider the pagans, they had no one to turn to. Why? Well, their priests and their gods were of no help. I'm sure they prayed and made sacrifices and nothing changed. And we know that large numbers of pagans, uh, including the leadership, rulers, priests, doctors, and others, fled as far as possible to get away from the plague. But they left something behind. They left their sick and they left their elderly. They left those people behind without any of the basic necessities of life. Yet the Christians, by and large, as the history tells us or teaches us or shows us, however you want to say it, they stayed. They cared for their own sick. They helped each other. And they even helped their pagan neighbors and cared for them and got sick and died. And at the end of the day, the impact of Christians serving their neighbors during these times, risking sickness and death, were felt throughout the Roman Empire when things got back to a different way. Whatever you're holding on to, consider it a loss for the sake of Christ. Flee, pursue, fight. Because of what? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Not my words, the Bible's words. Take hold of the eternal life without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. Flee, pursue, fight. I want to spend the last few minutes here as we're wrapping this up, uh, considering the Apostle Paul in the context of the New Testament. And when you go through the New Testament, uh, Paul does present a very uh, formidable figure. His presence was felt throughout the, first, uh, the, the New Testament. We first see this in the book of Acts. There we find the zealous Jewish Pharisee, Saul, seeking to uphold the law as he knew it. He pursued Christians with just as much zeal. He arrested many and he gave his tacit approval and support of the Christians that were killed for their trust in Christ. But then he encountered Jesus, as we know in Acts, on the road to Damascus. He was on his way, you see, folks, with letters from the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem to arrest as many Christians as possible. But Paul was changed by his encounter with Jesus. He became from a persecutor of Christ to a servant of Christ. And we can see the depth and the impact of Christ in the life of this great missionary apostle in his letters in the New Testament. We see in there his great love and pastoral heart for the brothers and sisters in Christ. Was Paul perfect and without sin? Of course not. But he was always quick to remind his people, his readers, that without Christ he was lost and only deserving the wrath of God. He was impatient at times. It seems that he was quick to judge at times. Yet he was a sinner who was saved by a Savior whom he loved and served until his death. And his love for Jesus often could not be contained. We see this in his writings. When he was writing to the Roman church, detailing the very core and essential truths of Christianity, he records for us was no doubt, I really believe this, a spontaneous Holy Spirit-led adoration of Christ. We call it a doxology. But here are his words. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We see this again here in our text in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. Paul breaking out in an adoration of God. God whom he served and loved. 
What would Timothy have thought when he read Paul, Paul's adoration of God here in this letter to him? Well, Paul knew that Timothy needed encouragement. He was facing some great, great troubles in the church. And what better encouragement is there for you and me to be reminded of the love and mercy and the greatness and sovereignty of Christ in our difficult times? No, friends, we serve God. The same one Paul adored. The God that Paul called the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Friends, this is not the God of our culture. This is God who Paul said is alone, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. This is not the God that our culture serves and adores. You know, wealth, fame, power, and self. This is God whom no one has seen or can see. Friends, this is God. Blazing holiness, beyond understanding, beyond being fully known, beyond being fully comprehended. So what is the only reasonable and only sensible response for those of us who have been saved by his grace and mercy through his son, Jesus Christ? May I end this message by saying this is our response. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Indeed, you are glorious. You are, yes, other. You're holy other. You're transcendent. But at the same time, we meet you at the foot of the cross to your son, Jesus Christ. And your mercy and love is displayed for us on that cross. And I pray for all those who are hearing this and seeing this. I don't know where they are in their journey, Lord. But I pray that you would grant them repentance, so that you would open their minds and their hearts to the great mercy and love of Christ that we find at the cross. And Lord, thank you so much, for you are indeed amazing and wonderful and glorious and blazingly holy. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much. God bless you. God keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Shalom.